Welcome back to TalkNorth.com. Thank you for listening. If you can, please download before you listen. It helps our business. I'd also like to thank our producer, Brandon Morton, and let you know if you'd like to sponsor this program or any of the programs on the network. You can reach me at jsouhan47 at gmail.com. Starsky. <laughs> oh, we're partners. You're listening to Stephen Strom on TalkNorth.com. And we are live in Las Vegas. Yes, spring break for me. I'm in heaven uh, right now. You're listening to the Strom Sports Show. Stephen Strom here. It is 65 degrees right now. Beautiful, beautiful out here in Las Vegas. Um, like I said, I'm in heaven. Uh, you know I'm a gambler. You know I like the sports bet. I-, I-, I could never live here, okay? That's number one because I wouldn't be able to survive financially. Number two, I mean, it- I would never be able to focus. I mean, it is everywhere you go. I mean, I'm in my hotel right now. Because I am a, listen, I commit to what I do. And this is a podcast, and I commit to doing this every week. So I'm going to stick with it. I brought my microphone through TSA, passed it. I brought my computer. I brought everything to record today. Um, So I'm a trooper. I could be out right now, but I'm doing this because I want to. A lot of good stuff going on in Minnesota sports. But, I mean, it's just incredible. And for a 21-year-old kid uh, that loves sports, I mean, this is heaven. There's no other way to say it. It's beautiful weather. It's beautiful casinos, it's beautiful sports books, and it's Vegas, and it's absolutely, it's clean, you know, people like to tell me, oh, it's kind of like New York, no, you know, it's not, because New York is dirty, the people are mean, here, it's like people really are genuine, I'm giving you like a trip itinerary instead of sports, but I just need to talk about this for a second, how beautiful this place really is, and it's pretty affordable, you know, look. They're going to get you on your gambling thing. So, you know, you get your little card. You know, I have to get that, but I haven't gotten the card yet. Uh, you get your little card, and you get your rewards, and that's what we do. You know, I, you know, tough night for blackjack for me yesterday, but I made it up today with the uh, roulette. I mean, I was really hot. And, I, and by the way, it is very intimidating, very intimidating to go up to those blackjack tables because, listen, these guys do – some of these guys do this for a living. A living. Like, this is their job. And then you have me, Squirrely Steven, coming in. It really, I mean, I've never really played a legitimate game of blackjack before because I've never been to AC. I wanted Vegas to be like my first casino time. Anyways, let's get back to sports. Richard Coffey, he joins me today. The son, the father of Amir Coffey, who is outstanding right now. Absolutely. He is willing the Gophers to an at-large bid right now. Richard will join me. If I mean, if you've been listening, you know who Richard Coffey is, 1986 and 1990. Uh, paratrooper, unbelievable power forward for this team. Um, you know, and then guy actually got signed by the Timberwolves, and he had his son, and his son's playing at Minnesota right now, and he's just having an unbelievable year. Gophers, uh, what a win! And I'll get into it in just a bit here, but Richard will join me in just a bit, and I want to talk about the Wild, and that's what we start with today. You talk about, and I went back and forth with a couple of my buddies about this. You you think who wins the trade deadline? Okay, and you think, oh, maybe Nashville. Nashville got Wayne Simmons, and Nashville got uh, Mikhail Granlin. Then you go to the Jets; they got Nathan Bayou. And then you go, you know, then you got the Blue Jackets who got Matt Duchesne. Forget that. The Wild won the trade deadline. They won in Tampa for the first time since 2010. They looked refined. They looked structured. They looked fresh. Ever since these trades they made. I don't know what happened to these guys, but it's like everybody woke up. And I, I, I'd be lying to you if I said, oh, this is the team I expected. This is this is the team and better than I expected. I never thought. When the, when the Wild went through that horrible, horrible stretch a few weeks ago, they were dead in the water. And then they make these trades for Ryan Donato, Kevin Fiala. You trade away Nino Niederreiter, Mikael Granlin, Charlie Coyle, and you think it's over. And then they just go on this tear. They are 6-0-2 in their last 8. And 8-2-2 two and two in their last 12 on the road. Dubinick wins for the 6th time in 7 starts. Zucker has a hat-trick yesterday. Donato has 2 assists. Greenway's playing out of his mind. Erickson Eck. I mean, you're starting to see like everything sort of come together. And I know like we want to see this right now. I'm just hoping they can carry this into the postseason because it doesn't matter how you play in October, November, December. It matters how you play going into the playoffs. February, late March, early April. 
if you are hot, you can beat anybody. And you're telling me the Calgary Flames are the a, a unanimous number one? To, a, a, this West is wide open. And you even saw yesterday. The Wild took it to the best team in the league by far. The Lightning have 50-something wins. I mean, they have been dominant so far. Wild trouts in there and beat them. I mean, blanket them. 3 nothing. What is, I mean, it is remarkable the way, and like I said, I can't give enough credit to Bruce Boudreaux and the staff for getting these guys to continue to play. But if I'm looking at the trade deadline, this whole thing, and I know a lot of people are going to try to tell me that the Predators, they got Wayne Simmons, Ryan Hartman, and Granlin, and all this kind of stuff. I, I think it was addition by subtraction in a lot of ways with the Wild. You got rid of your core guys. And look, I, I was upset to see Granlin go. Granlin was not the issue. But Charlie Coyle, I mean, let's be honest. I already went through this. He just didn't pan out. Nino Niederreiter, he got hurt and he just didn't look the same. He had an awesome, awesome playoffs uh, postseason you know, a few years ago. Pretty good regular season. And he just fell off. You know, When he got injured last year, he just never looked like he was the same. You made a huge, huge gamble by giving those guys away and... Like I said, I said this before, when Fenton traded those guys away, it was a win-win. It was an absolute win-win because even if the Wild stunk and they plummeted and they were still dead and they didn't get to the playoffs, well, you expected that. And that's what people were crying for. Oh, rebuild, rebuild this team. They're not good enough. So then your wish is granted. But then the other side, the upside, the trade value, and this is why teams do it, and this is why you're going to probably see a lot of GMs maybe copy what Fenton just did. Take away your three core guys. Let's get young. Let's get a Kevin Fiala, 20, 22 years old. Let's get a Donato, 22 years Let's get these younger, faster guys, skilled, unproven. And let's go. Let's see, let's, see, let's see what they got. And he struck gold. He didn't strike silver. He struck gold with these trades. And he looks like an absolute genius right now. As the Wild, who it is remarkable how a couple of weeks or a couple of games into a season can change everything, but it totally has with this team. And now they sit at 33 and 27, second in the wild card, three up against Arizona, four up against Colorado. You looked at the schedule, and I looked at it after they played Detroit and the Rangers. And you said, "Okay, we're gonna get to. We're really gonna get to see what this team's made of. Are they for real? Or are they just beating bad teams?" And they go on and beat St. Louis in overtime, Winnipeg in Winnipeg, Calgary in Calgary. They lose two shootouts to Nashville, the second best team in the West. They go on the road and beat Tampa Bay, who's fifty-one and now thirteen. It was gut check. T- it was gut check time for this team. And they responded. And now you're rolling. Zucker, Dubinick, Grandlin, uh, Greenway, Erickson Eck. Donato is just uh, every game the guy gets a point. You got to just continue on here. You, you don't want to get stagnant. That's the one thing I'll say. You don't want to get, you don't want to be, you know, you saw what happened with the Blues. The Blues went through that unbelievable streak in February and, and you know, January. But now they've kind of come, you know, come down to earth. You don't want to see that come late March, early April with the Wild. You want to see them continuously on this trend. And like I said, it's a new core. It's not the same team. So in the playoffs, when people say, oh, you know, same core, it's not. And the West is completely up for grabs. Richard Coffey, he's up next. As promised, we are joined by former Minnesota Golden Gopher forward Richard Coffey. He played from 1986 to 1990. He is the father of current point guard Amir Coffey. Who's, this is great timing for uh, Rich to come on because Amir actually just won Big Ten Player of the Week, putting up 31-12 and 12 against Northwestern in a huge one. Richard, Steven Strom here. I can't thank you enough for giving me the time today. Welcome on to the Strom Sports Show. Thank you for having me on. Oh, anytime. It's a pleasure. Okay, let's first start um, as a father, okay? And I, I don't know, and people should know this because um, it's very impressive. You have two daughters, Sydney, who played professionally overseas, Nia, who was picked number five overall, overall in the NBA, WNBA draft. She played at Northwestern. Amir is healthy. He's top ten in the scoring in the Big Ten. He's been terrific this year, leading the team in assists. 
Did you ever have a moment where you're watching your kids on TV or you're at your kids' games where you almost got to pinch yourself and think how grateful you are to have such talented kids at this level? You know, I, I am extremely grateful. I, you know, uh, I've seen from the very beginning how much, how hard they all have worked and, you know, the, the times and the sacrifices that they have all put in the gym, you know, not, you know, getting up early Saturday morning and, and going to the gym with me, whether they wanted to go or not, you know, <laughs> they still came <laughs> <laughs> and, and just, and, and I think it's rewarding for them as well to see some success in the game after um, after so many years of, of being involved with it and, and sacrificing. And, you know, they, start, they sacrificed a lot of things as a kid. I mean, like any kid, when you when you put in so much time into one area, you sacrifice some things. Right. You know, when you play when you play AAU basketball in the summer, you you know that Friday night movie that that your boy that your 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 boys or some of your girlfriends might be going to see at nine o'clock and you have an eight o'clock AAU game, you might not be going to that movie. And, you know, some of those sleepovers that some of the kids are doing, you might miss some of those because you have other things going on. So they sacrificed a lot, but I think, I think they also had an opportunity to reap some of the rewards from that. I can't agree anymore. And like I was telling you before, you know, when you are, and I played during the AAU circuit, he, Richard's 100% right. I mean, these weekends are dedicated to basketball, and I, I know for sure that you guys definitely went around the United States, wherever it may be, Vegas, Florida. So this is, listen, it was a commitment from the start. So uh, 100% agree. Now let's go to Amir, four-star recruit, ranked 38th in the top 100 his uh, his senior year. Look, he had offers from Arizona, Michigan State, Wisconsin, but he made the decision to stay home. And, and now you're starting to see guys like Gabe Kausher, Daniel Oturu, Jarvis Omersa deciding to stick to their roots. How important is it to get a homegrown talent like Amir to Minnesota? And now you're starting to see that trend develop. I think it's extremely important. I, I think right now Minnesota has so much talent um, that can compare with the talent throughout the nation. When I first got here in 1986, it was not that way. We we probably had, you know, Minnesota probably had three or four D1 players leaving the state at that time. But now there's a ton of D1 players in the state of Minnesota, and it's, and it's crucial to be able to keep some of those individuals here. And, um, you know, it really the, – the first the first guy that stayed here on the Patino, I think, was, was Jarvis Johnson. Yep. You know, and unfortunately, Jarvis didn't get a chance to play. But the first guy that stayed, that got an opportunity to play, was Amir. And, you know, a lot of things went into that decision. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons about playing in your home state. And um, I think for Amir, he thought the, the, the pros outweighed the cons. And he decided to stay home. And since then, you you have had, you know, some other um, players that have really get, given the University of Minnesota a really strong look, like th- like the three freshmen that we have on the team now. The, all three of those guys are going to be uh, going to have really strong careers at the University of Minnesota. A hundred percent agree. Um, I, I want to go back to what you were saying. I, I know that your kids sacrificed a lot growing up and getting into the gym, but I wanted to ask you this. How did your experience, and from what I, and my dad is a huge fan, and he told me you were the best rebounder in the Big Ten, and you were a hard worker, you were the grinder on the court. Tell yeah. me how your experience in college, and even in the NBA, because if you didn't know, Richard did get uh, get signed by the Timberwolves. How did yeah. your experience help Amir uh, growing up? How did you kind of mentor him? Well, I tell you, it, my experience kept all three of my kids. For, for one thing, what I did with my kids right away is I, I taught them very early on the fundamentals of dribbling. You know, I was I was a six six power forward, mm-hmm. and um, a six six power forward has a hard time making a living playing basketball. <laughs> 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 so, um, so I, I I I said right away, I don't care if my kids are five five or six ten; they're gonna know how to dribble the basketball. <laughs> yep. And, and change directions and, and pull up jump shots. And so I, I start training them right away, all three of them right away to dribble the basketball. And I remember starting a team, I, I, Amir tried out for, I think Amir was in the second grade, he tried out for a fourth grade um, summer team. And he made the team, and, and the guy, it was a winter team, and the guy told me he was going to play Amir at the fourth spot because Amir was still one of the tallest kids. On 